we'll get started here. So it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome uh, Samuel Gershman uh, from Harvard University. So uh, Sam uh, got his BA in Neuroscience and Behavior from Columbia in 2007, and then his PhD in Psychology and Neuroscience from Princeton in 2013. After that, he uh, joined uh, the Department of Brain and Com Cognitive Sciences at MIT as a postdoctoral fellow from 2013 to 2015. So he was right across the street from me for uh, about two years there, although I don't believe I, we ever met when we were there, did we? I, I, don't, I don't think so, even though his, his postdoctoral advisor was on my thesis committee. So that tells you how, uh, how much people at MIT actually talk to each other. So in any case, it's my great pleasure to, to uh, welcome him. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So as you probably noticed, I'm not a computer scientist. Um, I'm a cognitive scientist. But the reason I'm here speaking to you today in a computer science seminar is because I think that cognitive science has something uh, to tell us uh, about how to build machines that learn and think like people. Um, and I'm going to use video games as a particular case study of that question. I want to start by just emphasizing um, my collaborators in this work, and in particular, uh, Pedro Cervides, a graduate student uh, who has done most of this work. All right, so let me start from <coughs> by, start by summarizing a kind of seductive hypothesis. Uh, um, now, uh, if you look at the machine learning that's being done today, a lot of it is in the framework of deep learning, and um, one motivation for why deep learning might be not just a useful tool for solving engineering problems, but actually something more like human intelligence, something approximating human intelligence, is because it has this kind of brain-like architecture. We can talk about neurons and synapses between neurons and layers of computation and neural plastic, synaptic plasticity and so on, right? So there's something vaguely brain-like about it, and that seems attractive if we want to build something that thinks like the brain. Um, and then you combine that with the, the observation that when you train these networks on large amounts of data, they can, in some cases, achieve human-level performance on certain tasks like object recognition, speech recognition, uh, maybe even video games. So if we put these two things together, the seductive hypothesis that, all right, maybe, maybe this really does tell us that um, neural, deep neural networks are actually how human intelligence works. Um, And um, today I'm going to focus on one particular uh, domain in which the seductive hypothesis has um, been discussed extensively, which is uh, video game playing. So there, we were inspired by this paper, as, as I'm sure many other people were, uh, that came out in 2015 by the fledgling company DeepMind. Um, and what they did was they took a, a fairly standard deep convolutional neural network um, that would take in pixels, uh, the, the, the pixel images from an Atari game uh, at each moment in time, and it would spit out uh, joystick commands. And by training this network over uh, many games, and, or, or, or rather on an individual game, but for a long time, they could get, at least for some of these games, um, human or even superhuman performance asymptotically. Right. So if you train it long enough, you could get it to play as well as a human on many of these games. Um, so that was really that, that that was undoubtedly a very impressive feat, and it, then it, it spawned this question: All right, well, if it's playing as well as humans, does that mean it's playing like humans? Okay, and that's the question that we as cognitive scientists want to study, right? Because we cannot just look at performance and come to the conclusion that this machine is playing like humans. We have to dig a little bit deeper. So, Sam, yes. What is that horizontal line? I can't read. Oh, sorry. This is the this is human performance. Right here. Um, now, you know, don't take these particular bars as um, gospel because you know different algorithms get different levels of performance. So, you know, gradually they've kind of pushed more more of these games up into up above human level performance. Um, but but that's a little bit besides the point, as you'll see in a second. All right. So so is this how humans learn? Uh, let me just lay my cards down up front. Um, we think that. There are really two key properties of human intelligence. These aren't, these aren't the only properties of human intelligence that we might care about, but these are properties that we think, if we want to have an account of how humans play video games, we should really acknowledge these properties. So um, the first one is rapid learning from few examples. Um, and you can contrast this with the kind of learning that um, these deep learning systems do, 
where they, they need to, st to inhale vast amounts of training data, right? Um, and then the flexible generalization, you can contrast this with um, the inflexibility of these deep learning systems, that you could make trivial changes to uh, video games and the system that was trained on it would be unable to adapt quickly to those games. It might need to be retrained extensively to adapt to those variants. Um, so I think it's safe to, to say that at, at least uh, to the extent that we think that humans are capable of these things, we have not yet built um, machine learning systems that have these properties particularly deep learning systems. Um, so let me, let me go into this in a bit more detail. It's quite informative to look at which games um, the deep Q learning network, as, it was, as this network was called, did well on, and which ones it did poorly on. So if you look at the top, here are the ones that it did really well on. Things like Pinball, Breakout, Star Gunner. These are games that uh, place a premium, premium on fast sensory motor decision making. Right? So if you can really quickly move your paddle around and break out um, and aim it really well, then you can do quite well. And that's not, that's not the whole of it, right? But, but if you don't, if you can't do that, and humans have limited ability to, um, to they, have, they have limitations on their uh, sensory motor coordination, then there's going to be a limitation on performance. Um, and computers are not really bound by those limitations, at least these implementations. Now contrast this with the, the, the games that did really bad on. So look at here, Montezuma's Revenge. Um, zero percent. It basically didn't get any points on Montezuma's Revenge. Um, now since then, uh, computer scientists have made some progress and have developed uh, architectures that can get above zero. Um, but what's going on in Montezuma's Revenge? I don't suppose that many of you have actually played Atari games. You can actually download Atari emulators and play all these games. Uh, and they're pretty fun. Uh, at least you don't play a lot of modern video games. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so Montezuma's Revenge I should have uh, shown a picture. I'll show you a picture in a moment of a, of a different game. But Montezuma's Revenge is representative of a bunch of different games. Frostbite is another one that I'll talk about it more extensively, um, where the, the challenge is not about sensory motor decision making or any kind of perceptual processing. It's really con more conceptual. You have to understand how the game works, the game mechanics, the rules of the game. And we are, we're going to argue that um, People do well on these games precisely because what they're doing during learning is acquiring something of like something like a theory of the game, okay? And I'm going to describe a computational system that does that does this kind of theory induction from um, its experience with the game, and then can achieve human uh, human-like performance on the game. So let me illustrate to you what I mean by this. Um, so so this is uh, some video from the Frostbite game. Let me see if this plays. Yeah, OK. All right, so this is Frostbite Bailey. He's jumping around getting points by jumping on these ice flows. And you might not notice this at first, but he's actually building an igloo up here. Um, now, if you play this game for a while, you'll discover that if you hit these birds, that hurts you. Uh, you'll at some point also see some fish that, w that if you intersect, intersect with the fish, you'll get some points. Um, and at later levels, other kinds of uh, agents are introduced, like bears that could hurt you and stuff like that. OK. Um, so w we coined this term, the frostbite challenge, as a kind of challenge for, for AI to achieve human-like cognition. And if you want to learn more about this, I, I'd refer you to this, this expansive paper by Lake Ullman Tenenbaum and, uh, and me called Building Machines That Learn to Think Like People. Um, so what, do we, what, what would we actually have to do to build a machine that learned and thought like people in this game of frostbite. So the first most basic stage is we want to reach basic human level performance, right? So after enough training, however it went, you'd, you'd be able to, to achieve the same number of points as humans. And um, in some sense, at least the more recent systems can achieve that, right? So if you train them long enough, they can achieve human level performance. Um, but what about the, the second stage? So can we reach human level performance as quickly as people do? Um, that That is still a little bit out of reach. Um, and then uh, the third stage is, can we perform new tasks or, go, um, or, or achieve new goals with little or no retraining? Right, so, so to summarize, we're, we're, I will say that basically we're still at this first stage right now. Um, now, it's actually a little bit ironic that when this paper came out in Nature, it, it had this cover image. And it had in big capital letters, learning curve on it, right? Um, but 
although it was a certain, uh, certainly an, an impressive engineering feat that, that DeepMind could build this network that would play um, some games at human level performance, lear the learning curve was actually the least compelling part of this whole story, okay? Because uh, l let's actually look at a learning curve. Um, right, so these are hours of gameplay. This is the human level performance asymptotically. So, they, so they, they weren't showing any human learning curves. I'm going to show you many human learning curves soon. Um, okay, but so, so this, is the, this is the DQN, the Deep Q Learning Network, okay? So, you know, even after like 800 hours of, or 900 hours of gameplay, it's still basically barely inching upward and very, very far below uh, human performance. Um, right, so, so now you could ask, all right, this is, this is um, asymptotic human performance. Right, how long did it take humans to get to that performance level? That's how long, okay? Um, now, you could say, well, all right, DQN, that's just kind of a vanilla thing. We can do better than that. Here, here's another variant, a double DQN. Don't worry about the details of this architecture. It's kind of like a souped up DQN. Uh, and you can, you, you can soup up the soup ups. And in, you can even get kind of tantalizingly close here. Look, this is another algorithm, op tightening. Um, all right, but let's just zoom in for a second. Well, maybe not so, so much, right? So like, all right, it's still, clearly there's something different going on here. Um, now, there's an important criticism of what I'm showing you, that, that this is a, a, essentially an unfair comparison, okay? The reason is that uh, deep neural networks, when they're training these video games, they have, to be, they have to train their whole visual system, their whole brain has to be basically evolved from scratch on this, on this game. Whereas humans have had their whole developmental trajectory, as well as, you know, uh, a long evolutionary history to develop their visual systems and motor capabilities and so on. And so maybe humans just have to kind of fine tune this a little bit, whereas the DQN has to start from scratch. Um, okay, so, so that, I think that's a very valid criticism. Um, so, and here's how I'm gonna try to address it. Um, let's imagine that we take a point on the um, human learning curve, um, uh, where, so, so we say at this point in the learning curve, humans are getting, let's say, 100 points. Okay, now I'm gonna find the point on the machine's learning curve that achieves the same performance. So I'm gonna find wherever point in the machine learning curve um, the, the machine is also learning 100 points. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those two learning curves that are performance matched at, the, at that particular point, and then I'm gonna look at the first derivative of the learning curve. So that's like how their learning rate, how fast are they learning? Um, and I'm gonna compare those things, right? So now we can say, uh, we, can, we can evaluate the hypothesis, right? Maybe, maybe um, the DQN really is learning the same way that humans are, but they're just on radically different parts of the same learning curve. So if that's true, assuming that the learning curve is monotonic, then when you performance match, you should get the, the, the derivatives of that learning curve should be the same. Okay, so yes? Just a little bit confused here yeah. in terms of uh, uh, are you providing the machine and the human the same setup? Because you refer to there are rules that actually you tell the players about what this particular game No, the, the players, the, I will get to that. I mean, we do actually, in one variation of these experiments, we do tell them the rules. But in what I'm showing you here, they just, they, they just go them. and play the game, yeah. But, but as you'll see, it doesn't really matter. Okay. For the kinds of, com we're talking about like orders of magnitude sort of comparisons, right? Um, but does everyone understand the basic logic here of this, this particular analysis, which is that I'm going to try to evaluate the question of whether these two, the, the DQN and the human are on the same learning curve. And if that were true, then the, the derivatives of the, of the learning curves on these performance matched comparisons will be the same. But in fact, um, they're not the same. And this is plotted on a log scale. So what you're seeing here are the humans and the, DQ, the double DQN. Um, and really humans are an order of magnitude, have an order of magnitude faster learning rate d for every performance match comparison that you could uh, conceive. And these are in a few different games. Um, so what does this tell you? It tells you that it's not just the case that humans and machines are on the same, different parts of the same learning curve, that humans are really doing something different from the DQ. And we want to understand what is it that they're doing differently. Yes? No, no, this is, these are the derivatives. So all this, if it goes down, this doesn't mean that they're getting worse. It just means that they're learning less quickly. Yeah. Um, and also, you just keep in mind, like, performance, that's a, that's a noisy variable, right? So in theory, like, the, just because of randomness, um, the learning curve go, translatingly go down. All right. So I'm going to lay out kind of the big picture of what we think humans are doing. 
Um, so we think that from the very beginning, um, people, when they see these games, they see objects, agents, and physics. Um, now, they don't necessarily know all the properties of these objects and agents in physics, but they can recognize that these are, uh, there, there are objects, there are agents, and there are physical uh, relations, um, and um, they have to discover what those are, but already they strongly constrain the kinds of things that they're going to learn from this game. Um, and they're going to actively explore possible object relational goals and come to multi-step plans that uh, exploit what they've learned, that exploit this theory-like representation. So they're going to learn um, they're going to learn, for example, that they should you know, try out these, these ice flows to figure out how they work, and eventually figure out that you should build this igloo, um, figure out which obstacles to avoid on later levels. And I think if you introspect when you play these games, you'll, you'll, ha come, you'll have kind of the same feeling that this is what you're doing. But we're going to try to go beyond introspection here. Um, so what drives such rapid learning? Um, we think a critical property of human learning is that um, we can do, we have very strong inductive biases that allow us to basically learn from one or a few examples. So for example, if you um, collide with a bird, you get hurt in frostbite. And then the question is, all right, what happens next? Like, how likely are you to collide with a bird after that? Um, and the basic finding here is that you only need to collide with a bird um, you know, one or two times, and then you basically avoid that bird for the rest of the game. Now, the, de the, the the DQN definitely does not exhibit this behavior. It's just going to keep slamming into the birds over and over again until it kind of eventually figures out a, a policy that will allow it to, to avoid birds. Um, all right, what about the, the other question? So another inf possibly um, unfair characteristic of how I'm um, comparing these uh, humans to machines is that you know, humans know stuff about the world. They know about igloos and ice flows and bears. And sure, like, it's not very intuitive to say that like, running into birds kills you and running into fish gives you points, uh, or jumping on ice flows builds igloos. Um, but but maybe, there, maybe we, we're coming into this with some semantic knowledge, and that's giving us a little bit of an advantage. Um, so what happens if you just blur the screen? So now it's really hard to identify what, what you're looking at. Um, how is that going to affect um, human performance? Um, and the answer is that it doesn't really affect it very much at all. Um, these are super noisy because there's not a ton of data on these curves. I apologize, but um, but the basic the basic point here is that um, we can perceive objects as spatial temporal spatial temporally continuous entities um, without necessarily identifying the semantic label associated with that object. And we can we can learn about those objects. Um, and, and I should say, that we're not able to identify the label on the basis of like, visual characteristics, like, oh, that looks like a bird. But we can still identify that th there is this object there that moves in a particular way and has particular effects. And I can learn its properties. And the fact that I could, I, under normal circumstances, identify it as a bird is irrelevant to that. Um, another um, interesting property of human learning, which I haven't talked about yet, is social learning. So you could watch an expert play a game. And um, it, after just a few minutes, you could extract a lot of experience um, from that, um, a lot of knowledge from that. And it's not just like if you watch someone play an expert play for two minutes, you're not just getting an additional two minutes worth of experience, which of course for a neural network would be meaningless. Um, you're learning something else, which is that if you watch an expert play, they're doing things. They're, they're, you can safely assume that they're already following a close to optimal policy. And therefore, you can infer things uh, from their behavior that you didn't even observe in the gameplay itself. So for example, an expert will not really collide with birds. Um, so this is, this, is this is the bird collisions that you would make um, uh, at just doing play by yourself. Uh, and here are the, here's what happens when you get to watch two minutes of an expert. Um, so now, you, the, the mode here is 0. That means that. You, you, you may never have even seen a, a bird collision, but you know that it's bad. And the reason you know it's bad is because you saw the expert avoided birds. Right? That's a form of negative evidence. And that's, and that's a kind of an inductive inference that's really ch um, that really goes beyond the simple experiential learning that um, most of these neural network architectures engage in. Um, another question that, that, uh, goes, to the er that um, goes to the earlier point is what about instruction? Can we? Um, 
can we change people's performance by giving them some additional instruction? So, so before I said that um, we, we just let people play these games, but we can also just give them the manual and let them read it for a few minutes. And that does, uh, that does at least a little bit enhance um, people's performance on, on, the, on, um, on this Frostbite game. So to summarize, um, blurring objects doesn't really do much. You don't need to actually know what the objects look like. Um, but getting observation of an expert or getting instruction does help you. Um, and observation and instruction are both um, powerful clues to the underlying rules of the game um, that are not, that, that go beyond just direct exp um, experiential learning. Um, OK, so what about performing new tasks or goals with little or no retraining? I want to kind of enter entertain you with a thought experiment now. Um, so let's imagine that I, you learn how to play Frostbite, and then I decide to change the rules of the game or the goals of the game. So for example, I told you, right now your job is to get the lowest possible score, or get closest to 100, or 300, or 1,000, or 3,000, or any level without going over. Or beat your friend who's playing next to you, but just barely, not by too much, uh, so as not to embarrass them. Um, or go as long as you can without dying, die as quickly as you can, uh, pass each level at the last possible minute right before your temperature timer hits zero. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you about the temperature timer. You sort of eventually freeze if you don't beat the level. Um, um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that you could possibly be doing. And I, I would contend that I can give you these things, and it will take, it maybe take you a little bit of time to, to adjust, but far shorter than it would take something like a fully trained uh, DQN to do, right? So how do we do that? How do, how do we have this kind of flexibility? Um, and the, our argument is that humans um, don't just do pattern recognition and function approximation, they learn something like a theory of the game. Uh, and these theories are what support rapid learning, efficient planning, and flexible generalization. Um, so now I've been kind of, I've been telling you some, some properties of, of human learning based on our experiments, but now let me offer some actual uh, constructive ideas about how to build a better machine learning system for this purpose. Um, and this is the basic architecture. Uh, we call it explore model plan, or EMPA. Um, and the idea here is that there, there's really three stages here, but they're all kind of integrated together. So uh, in the first stage, um, there's a kind of perceptual um, transduction step, if you will, that takes the pixel images and converts it into something like a symbolic description where um, you, it tells you uh, a collection of predicates, like that a particular agent is on the ice, or another agent is colliding with a crab, and so on. Um, and then from those symbolic descriptions, we're going to do a form of theory induction, where we're going to try to basically learn the rules of the game, like what happens when an agent collides with a, a crab, or an agent collides with a fish. Um, and, and then given that theory, that theory will allow the, eight, the, the player to simulate uh, forward uh, and generate multi-step plans, which can then lead to new interactions with the game. Um, and there's another important aspect of this, which is exploration. How do you know which parts of the game space uh, to explore? And we're going to argue that we have object-oriented, a form of object-oriented curiosity that drives us toward exploring objects rather than particular game states or embeddings of game states or whatever. Um, so what is the theory language that I'm talking about? Just as an illustration, we're going to use this language that was developed by Tom Shaw uh, called the Video Game Description Language. And actually, recently, we've been trying to uh, build new versions of uh, VGDL that can support more complex kinds of physical interactions. But this is kind of the basic idea. So um, it consists of um, a collection of sprites, the sprite set, um, like the avatar, missiles, I aliens, and so on. Um, uh, a mapping of the levels, an interaction set that tells you about what happens when different objects interact with each other, and a termination set that tells you um, what, ha what, what you need to do to, to complete the game. Uh, and you can give it a little map that, that sets up the layout. And so you can, so we, there, the VGDL comes with a parser that you can take this and put it into a game, um, uh, into a, a, a visual game like this and actually play the game. And we can you know, easily build APIs to interact with this. Um, um, and another reason why we were interested in this was because um, uh, there's an annual competition on, on uh, automated video game playing uh, that, that uses something like a version of VGDL. And um, so what, we, what we've done in our empirical evaluations has been, we, first we, we made a bunch of, we took some of these video game competition games 
plus a whole bunch of different variations of them. And then we also built our own games, and they've all, they're all expressed in these VG, uh, VGDL um, programs. But, the, but of course, people never, the pe people who play these games never get to see this. We're going to use this as a hypothesis about what people are actually learning about the game, that people are, are trying to induce this um, uh, game description from their um, experience with the game. So what does this look like? Uh, let me just give you an intuition for how this goes. So imagine uh, here, here, this is the, the avatar, the agent. Um, the pink lines here show um, the agent's, um, the, sorry, the player's belief, that, or the EMPA's beliefs about how different objects work. So, so this agent has kind of almost figured out how these cars work. It's really confused about how these logs work. Um, the, the white boxes show objects that the agent is curious about. So it's curious about like what happens when it goes on this road. So imagine the agent just was sitting there staring at, at looking at this stuff and, and seeing what happens. It hasn't yet tried to cross the road, so it doesn't know what's going to happen when I step on the road or what's going to happen when I interact with a, uh, a car. And I, what's going to happen when I go in the water? Or what's going to happen when I interact with this log? Or what is this thing uh, that says goal? Um, of course, it doesn't know. It doesn't read, so it doesn't know that. Um, uh, and then finally, the yellow lines show the agent's plan. So, so the agent specifically is going to construct plans, uh, um, at least in the beginning, to learn about the world. So it's going to say, all right, I don't know what these things do. I better go and interact with them and find out. Okay. Uh, and for, and it's, it's relevant that it's going to specifically interact with these things that are closest to it, right? It's not going to try to interact with all this stuff here because it needs to get past this part. And it doesn't yet know what these things do. All right, so here's a mid-stage uh, representation. So now it's figured out, all right, don't interact with the cars. They will run you over. Um, I know that they're going to consistently move in this direction. Um, it's still curious about what's going on up here because it hasn't yet gotten over here. Um, and it also it has it's generated a plan to uh, uh, satisfy its curiosity about the logs in the water. Uh, and now here's a late stage, so it's figured out what the logs do, uh, but it still hasn't figured out what this thing does. So it's generated an even longer plan to figure out how to get uh, to that goal and satisfy its curiosity. Um, and now another really cool thing that you can do with this architecture is you can generalize it. So once it's learned this theory, it can generalize to fairly different game um, uh, scenarios. So what happens if I like I move the game the goal over here, right? So it still knows, it still knows something about this object and can immediately generalize that uh, to that situation. It knows, all right, I need to get over here, um, and it, and of course the logs are in a completely different configuration and there's no road anymore. So, uh, but it can uh, still general take its knowledge that it learned from from the earlier version of the game and transfer it to this uh, new version of the game. But look, I've also introduced this new thing over here. What is this? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of curious about this and generate a plan uh, to go find out about it. Okay? So that kind of gives you the flavor of how this architecture works. Are there any questions about that? Um, all right, so let me give you an example of um, the kinds of games that we built that, that, that don't look quite as cool but embody some, some um, important ideas about relational, object-oriented relational learning. Um, so. Oops. Oh yeah. Sorry, I forgot. These are these are just stills. So uh, I do have a video game, li uh, a video later. So, um, so the idea is that the agent is this white square. It's kind of hard to see this green outline. And the agent in this first variant of the game, the le first level, the agent just has to collect all the yellow blocks. So that so the agent doesn't initially know what to do in this game. It has to figure out what the different blocks are, and eventually it'll figure out that uh, it's going to win the level by collecting all the yellow blocks. Um, now level two, there are no yellow blocks. But that's still the termination condition. What, but it, what it has to figure out is that when it touches the red blocks, they're going to turn yellow, and then it has to collect those uh, blocks. In level three, we can make this even more complicated. So we could say, all right, um, there are no red blocks, but you can push purple onto um, orange, and that disappears and turns purple into yellow. Okay. So now I've, st I've started to, to need this kind of relational theory about what happens when different objects interact, and I can make things happen by pushing them into each other. Um, and I could take this even one step further, and touching pink um, turns, uh, turns the pink block into orange, right? So I have this multiple levels of um, reasoning that would be required here to figure out how to, the different um, strings of relations that have to be satisfied to win the game. Um, this, is what the, this is what the model does on these different levels. All right, so it's, trying to, it's exploring different things, what happens. 
Oh, look, it figured out. Yeah, it's, it's still figuring things out. Um, now it figures out pushing blue into yellow um, ends the game. So now it figured out that you can um, turn red into yellow. Um, Anyway, you, you get the idea. Um, here's human, humans playing the game, so they're a little bit more tentative. But you'll see that they are doing something that seems qualitatively similar. Um, they're, they're exploring different object interactions. Um, and then they gradually figure out um, what the optimal policy is in terms of the, the so they're going to first explore in terms of these object-oriented interactions and then exploit that knowledge to efficiently achieve those object interactions. All right. Um, here, here's an example of learning curve. Actually, in this case, this is a little bit unusual in the sense that here the, the model is actually better, faster at learning than humans a little bit. Um, in in the, most of the other examples that I'll show you, there are um, the uh, um, in most of the other examples, it's um, they, they're either f at about as fast as humans or slightly slower. Um, here's another example of a fun game. So the, the agent has to, to pick up all the pink boxes to win, and there's a chaser, this green guy. Um, and um, um, the chaser is trying to pick up the yellow box. So um, the goal is that you have to pick up all the pink boxes before the chaser picks up the yellow box. Um, and in addition, on some of the levels, there's this blue fence. Um, and the, I'm uh, sorry, well, it says purple fence, but it looks blue over here. Um, there's this fence that the agent can go through and the yellow can't, can be pushed through, but the chaser can't pass. And that, that will have, serve a strategic purpose, as you'll see. Um, so this is the model, what the model does. All right, so, so now it, it figures out that it needs to push this yellow guy away so it can win. Won that one. Uh oh, things are getting more complicated here. Yeah, he was not fast enough. All right, he won that one. Oh, now that's really bad news. Um, but look what he does. Or so, so he loses this one, but he. But look what he does in the next one. So. He, did you see what happened? He pushed the yellow block into that fence, and the green block is programmed to chase the yellow block. So of course, he's just pining for that, block, that box that was pushed behind the fence he can't pass through. And then as he's distracted, the, the agent can go and pick up all of the other boxes. Right? So that's pr I think that's pretty clever reasoning that the, the system can engage in. And you can see that if you plot learning curves, the, the system is right on top of the, the, the EMPA is full, right on top of human learning. Now, now, we've done this with 90 different games. Um, and in general, um, the, so if you, this dashed line is the um, human norm performance. Um, and as you can see, there's some variability, but EMPA typically gets around human level um, performance on these games um, compared to, to, to the DQN, which is much lower. Uh, and if you look at the learning curves, you can see that uh, for these, these are six example games. Um, the green lines are human learning curves, the blue lines are EMPA, and the gray lines are um, DQN. Um, and you can see, look, oh, in pretty much all the games, the DQN's learning curve is either flat over the time scale that we measured it, or very gradual in this case compared to, to human um, and EMPA. So I, I see this as, as the first step towards more human-like learning uh, machines, which is just showing that the, the learning curves can look the same. And, and I, I wanted pause here for a second and just emphasize that, remember, the, the criticism before that, that I talked about is still valid here, right? It's not really fair, in some sense, to compare the DQN. But, but, but really, what the point that I want to make here is that what we've done is built a machine that has, as its starting ingredients, something that's plausibly, it has its starting ingredients and as, in its starting state and its learning mechanism, something similar to hu what humans bring when they start to play this game, right? So it's not, it's not a complete theory of how, how humans got all of these inductive biases to begin with, but it's a, it's a theory of what people do when they, when they start to play this game. Question. 
Yes. Is the assumption here that the players are not provided all the instructions at the start? They're even figuring out? Yeah, they're not provided any instructions. They just are trying to win the game. And somehow by watching the points, they know what things are, are favorable and what things are not? Yeah, yeah. And also just watching when they die, right? And replaying. Yeah, exactly. Yes? I don't know if it was just me, but in the first example that um, you, showed, uh, you showed us, yeah. I saw that the human played quite differently compared to the machine. Like, uh -huh. like the white block for the machine was moving constant. It didn't stop, but the human mm -hmm. actually between the movements, you could see how like there were there were small there were stop stopping in mm -hmm. between. Yeah, yeah. Movement. So is that that an indication that the human stops and thinks and then yeah. does the next next act, while the machine just basically runs the algorithm yeah. and acts on a trial and yeah. Well, you, you, yeah, that's a great observation. The 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 thing is, we have to be careful about interpreting the the time scale here because we basically. Sp the sped up the machine, like the machine actually is thinking a lot longer than, than humans are for this thing because our algorithm is not very efficient in, in terms of time complexity. Um, so it, it, so I, I agree that, that that's an important observation that sometimes people are stopping and thinking and then other times they're just moving. And I don't think we have an adequate account of that in terms of this kind of model yet, but I think that that's definitely something we'd like to eventually capture. Other questions about that? Okay. Um, we can also revisit this question of object interactions. So when something good or bad happens, um, is the agent likely to do that again or avoid uh, doing that again? Um, and you can see that it's very clear that um, humans and EMPA both are very likely to repeat uh, positive interactions, the things that, that deliver points, and um, avoid doing things that uh, are negative, and also avoid doing things that are neutral to some extent. Um, compare that to the, to, to the DQN, which is just constantly doing all sorts of things that are neither good nor bad, because it's just doing lots and lots of stuff, basically, that are not, that, that um, uh, and, and that's an indication that um, the DQN is not really um, internalizing the object-oriented nature of the game. That's our interpretation. Really. So why, why, yeah. are, why are there not three bars of equal size on that bottom graph, if it's just trying everything? Yeah, okay, sorry, I shouldn't say that it's trying everything. That's a good point. It's, I mean, it's spending a lot. But basically, the issue here is that there are many more neutral things than positive or negative things. And so, yeah. um, you know, it's spending a lot of time doing neutral things, basically. I mean, it's spending yeah. proportional amounts of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's exactly proportional, but maybe something like that. Yeah. Um, there's also, uh, we can also look at uh, a kind of learning to learn phenomena across levels of a game. So we can ask, once you've won, the first level, how long does it take you to win the second level? And you can compare humans to these uh, machine learning systems. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, humans and, and uh, EMPA are right on top of each other, more or less, <coughs> in terms of how many steps it takes them to win uh, level two after winning level one. Um, DQN is, is much longer. And in fact, for many uh, DQN agents just fail to win uh, level two. Um, Another interesting way to look at this, I don't know if we've like quite perfected the way to, to visualize these things, so if you have any suggestions, uh, I'd love to hear them. Uh, but we're trying to visualize heat maps of the exploration patterns of these agents. So, so here are the, the two levels of the game, level one and level two. Um, here are the human exploration patterns across the two uh, levels, and then the corresponding exploration patterns for the two machine learning architectures. And you can see that basically after, so first of all, you can see even in the first level, the exploration patterns are very object oriented. It doesn't, the agent doesn't just wander around, it tries to go and see what those objects are all about. Um, and then once it's figured out that the goal here is to get these pink objects, then it basically just goes straight to the pink objects um, in the level two. Compare that to DQN, which is kind of all over the map, even after learning something, uh, learning how to win the game in level one. So let me uh, summarize the experiments in modeling. Um, so I've, I've argued that a theory based RL agent like EMPA. Um, can play games in human-like ways, so that's not just asymptotically the same performance, but it can has uh, comparable learning curves to humans, and it can generalize in a comparable way. Um, and the key to this, uh, the, uh, to, to this, to EMPA's abilities, is this idea of an object-oriented relational representation, um, and then that's combined with um, 
a theory induction algorithm for sample efficient learning and an object oriented uh, exploration algorithm. Um, now, some, some of you may be familiar with reinforcement learning terminology and it's often discussed, uh, there's often a contrast between model based and model free algorithms. So model free algorithms like temporal difference learning or, deep, deep, uh, or Q learning and DQN is an example of a model free learning algorithm. It doesn't build a model of the world. Um, it, uh, it just learns uh, an approximate value function through interactions with the game. Um, it, this is contrasted with a model-based algorithm that tries to learn a model of the world and uses that to plan. And you can think about EMPA as a form of model-based learning, but it's rather different from um, traditional model-based learning algorithms in the sense that um, typically um, people developing the algorithms think about it in terms of a mark of decision process um, over some tabular state, uh, state representation. So I'm going to enumerate a discrete set of states. D there are going to be transitions between them that satisfy the Markov properties. So transitions and rewards depend only on the current states and not the past states. Um, and then there's very efficient algorithms for solving these. But of course, for games like this, the state space just blows up. And the same goes for games like chess and go. Um, so you really can't do a traditional model-based um, algorithm in that way. And, but we think that, that model-based algorithms are still viable as theories of human cognition, but you need a different notion of model here. You need something more like the program or theory-like representation that I showed before. Um, and the, um, I also would just to like br to briefly mention that although our framework doesn't really use deep learning, um, I don't think that, I don't want to give the impression that I think deep learning is bad or useless or whatever. I think deep learning is an extremely useful tool in a more general toolkit that includes symbolic reasoning and, and theory learning. Um, but we have to think about, in my view, we have to think about the, the role of deep learning as providing something like pattern recognition, where pattern recognition or function approximation is an, is an appropriate solution to certain kinds of problems. So for example, if I want to do the, um, the perceptual stage of processing, so I want to get from the pixels to a symbolic description, that could be set. That could be cast into the format of a structured output prediction problem, and then you could use um, neural networks that are that um, to solve that problem to find a mapping from pixels to, to symbolic descriptions. Or you could use it in the theory induction part. You could say, if I want to go from from symbolic descriptions to theories, I could cast that as a different kind of a program search or, st or structured prediction problem, and use neural networks to help guide that search. So, for example, can I do some kind of vector space embedding of, of the program space and the game, um, the game description, uh, sorry, the, the game state description space. And once I, I put everything into a vector space, I can, I can now do various kinds of continuous, um, optim you can use continuous optimization algorithms. That's become very popular in machine learning lately. Um, and I can also use it for the planning part. So I could use a neural like value approximation as a heuristic to guide planning, because that's another big issue and you saw you see this also in architectures like AlphaGo. How do I efficiently search the, the game tree, this vast game tree? I can use value functions that are approximated by neural networks to guide my search to through good, prospectively good parts of the tree. OK, so the point here is that in the future, I hope that there's going to be some, some useful integration of deep learning and symbolic approaches. All right, to conclude, um, I posed the idea of human-like video game learning as a form of theory building, not pattern recognition. Um, and I've shown you that using theory induction methods in a simple but rich description language um, can do better um, with the acknowledgment that uh, we can still do much better than that. Right, thank you for listening. Not the DDQN, but the but our our yes, that's right. right. So we so we assume that you know how to already parse objects. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so would it be fair? Would it be a fair comparison then? Because so you're you're looking at the learning rate. Yeah. So it, it takes the it takes the DDQN a little bit more time. Yeah. It always take more time because it still has to go through the learning the representation. Yeah. And then you're getting to the part where it's it's uh, learning the value function, right? 
Yeah, but I don't think that this would be, it's an interesting question. I, I don't think it would be solved by, let's say, suppose we, we took the output of the perceptual parser and fed that into a DDQN, would it do better? I think not. Because even though it has objects as inputs, it doesn't know what to do with them. And actually, we've, we've, we've built architectures a little bit like that, not for these particular games, but for other games. And, and the, what it shows is that just being object-oriented is not enough. You need to have a kind of theory to, to use the objects in an intelligent way. So, so I guess yeah. your, your, your uh, thesis is then that yeah. the key is, is in the sort of object-oriented nature of, of input as opposed to sort of uh, you know, pickings and embeddings and then kind of figuring out what the value function is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does Yes, that's right. Yes. If you, uh, I, I assume you've done this. You've looked at lots of people. And you have data on, on, on how people play these mm -hmm. games. Yeah. Uh, are there that people who play well versus people who play poorly? Are, mm -hmm. there, are there things that you could learn from there in terms mm -hmm. of how the models are different or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I, I wonder, yeah, we ha I should say we haven't quantified that at all. Um, I mean, you can see some of the individual variability in these yeah. green curves. Uh, so it's definitely true that some people learn worse than others. I mean, we, haven't, we don't really have a good handle on why that is. These people were recruited through um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk service. So, that, so that's a, it's, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a nationally representative sample, but it's certainly more representative than it would be if we recruited students at Harvard and MIT. Yeah. Representative yeah. of India, basically. Well, well, actually, I think for these subjects, uh, I can't remember now if we only recruited them from the US. Sometimes we do that, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, I mean, have you published some of this already? We have the, the stuff that I talked about in the in first was um, so there's a there's this big theoretical paper called Building Machines That Learn and Think Like People. You can read that. It was published in Behavior and Brain Sciences. Some of the human experiments that I that's the first human experiments with Atari that I told you about, that was a short workshop paper that we published a few years ago. And I'm hoping that this kind the stuff that the most recent stuff that I just told you about, that's gonna be finished up in the next few months. We're going to talk about learning. Mm -hmm. So this is a specific kind of learning. When mm -hmm. you think about learning video games in terms of moving whatever the avatar is on, mm -hmm. on the screen and, uh, and achieving some specific goals, mm -hmm. the object, and so on and so forth. Um, but there are different, I, I guess there, I, I'm trying to generalize the games, um, not just the necessarily video games. Mm -hmm. Because video games has a sort of a big set of and, and, and if you sort of a think about games, there are there are games that are number games. There are you know even board games, for example. Um, sort of when you say learning, because because this is a learning specific to a sort of very artificial kind of uh, uh, motor learning skills to. Sort of Certain I don't think it's motor, actually. Right. I, yeah, it's, I, I, it's I don't think it's about motor, motor skills. I guess yeah. I, I was trying yeah. to sort of, yeah. there is a confined kind of characteristics in yeah. terms of learning uh, here. Right. Um, but try to generalize in, in human learning. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, sort of a specific aspect of learning, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that this is encompassing all human learning, absolutely not. There's some, I, in fact, I strongly believe that some forms of human learning look a lot more like the DQN than this, right? I'm just saying that, in, the, in fact, that's something that I've spent a lot of time studying. It's just that, that it, that's not the whole story. It's not like everything we do is like the D, learns like the DQN. So I, I'm in agreement with you, right? This is, we're studying learning in a particular domain where we think a particular class of learning algorithms is possible, but that's not a universal claim. Yeah. Uh, but am I yeah, addressing? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting, yeah. but it's just that sort of got me thinking. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Of how, how much experience do you need? 
Well, are you asking for like a theoretical characterization of sample efficiency, or I mean, like in some sense, if you run out these learning curves for long enough, you can you can make some inference about you know an empirical evaluation of sample efficiency. But are you asking for something I, else? I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if that does that. No, I, yeah. I, in either, yeah. Either an empirical. Yeah, the the, the, theori the theoretical stuff that's that that's tougher because I don't think standard kind of sample complexity um, analyses. I think it would be difficult to apply to these kinds of um, domains, but maybe maybe not. Yeah. Point. Yeah. We're assuming that, uh, but that if, if you achieve those points, you already learned all this to learn, and uh, you are at the same level. No, no, no. So just to clarify, so when we look at these performance matched curves, um, Like, let's take here. So, so you've only learned, let's say, like uh, 100 points right here uh, and up there. That's not learning everything there is to know, right? Because th if you look up here, like people are getting over 4,000 points, right? So that's just at a particular stage in learning where they've been matched, right? And both the human and the machine are doing a really crappy job at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're just, the, the goal of the machine is the same. Like, we're just, you run the machine on Frostbite, and then you're going to go back into its training history and say, all right, when were you getting around 100 points? And we'll do the same thing for the humans. When were you getting around 100 points? And then we're going to look at those two points in the learning curve and look at the slopes of the learning curve, those two points. Any more questions? Uh, in a yeah. mathematical perspective, are there functions, or I guess models, to kind of project how it would learn if you were to continue training for a couple of hours? Um, so we're talking about the DQ, about our agent. Yeah. But so so we know, about. so we're in a privileged position because we built the games out of VGDL descriptions. So we know that uh, the game, right. the true game is describable in the function class that we're learning in, right? So you have to make some assumptions about exploration. So uh, basically, provided that the agent explores all everything infinitely often, then you can guarantee that it will converge to the true, um, uh, under the assumptions that it's, you know, that, that it's a, uh, th eventually, eventually the agent will, 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 will hit the correct hypothesis since it's representable in okay, the hypothesis space. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a good question. Are you talking? Are you well? Yeah, I mean, in principle, you can give Empa any goal that you want, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be maximizing reward, right? And so that's part of its flexibility, because um, so it can use the same theory in service of different goals. Um, but we haven't studied this systematically yet. Yeah. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. Lots of questions. So uh, feel free to, if, if any of the graduate students have more questions, we have a graduate student uh, round table in 265 from now for the next hour plus. So let, join me in thanking my, our speaker.